to prepare a world-class workforce. And welcome to all our participants who are joining online as well. Thank you very much for availing yourself um, to this very critical um, conversation and discussion. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to quote here, you know, something that Dr. Salami said earlier on during the plenary session. And he said, the quality of education has to rise and be improved. We must upskill not just the youth, but our entire population. And Nigeria's labor force has to become fit for purpose. You know, and I think if there was anything that came from the conversations that have happened, you know, throughout the opening ceremony today, underlining that and a common theme there is, you know, really upskilling the human capital, education, and just the other city, you know, that was coming up from as a result of like investing in our youth and in our human capital. And so I think it's also important to mention that the strength and development of Lagos State is indeed tied and bound to Enging Betty, um, as I read in the, in the document in the brochure this morning. But I'd also like to add that the quality of the development in Lagos State will not surpass the quality of its human capital. Hence the importance of this very critical conversation that we're going to be having. And I'm very delighted you know, to note that we have a distinguished panel of industry experts, thought leaders, who are going to be engaging with this theme um, today. And so firstly, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Commissioner for Education, Mrs. Falashade Adefisayo, to my left. Very welcome, Ma. And then i also like to um, acknowledge Ms. Sad Sadna Pandey. Um, she is the Chief Education Officer, UNICEF. Very welcome to you. Very well welcome. Professor Olufemi Bamiro is also with us. He's the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Ibadan, and he's sitting here to my right. We also have with us Mr. Oreo Lua Boboye. He's the CEO of Jobberman, and he's here with us already too. And finally, we have Ms. Bumi Lawson. She's Mrs. Bumi Lawson. She's the MD, CEO of Edfin Microfinance Bank. Thank you so much for joining us. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Folawe Omikunle, and I'll be your moderator today. So to kick us off, I'm going to start with you, Mrs. Adefisai. <laughs> and, you know, I was reading um, a document recently, and, you know, it was shared in that document that there's been an increase in pass rates in regional examinations in Lagos State. But this has also been followed by an increase in students leaving school without a degree. I'd really like to hear your perspective on this. And I think this will really set the tone for the discussion that we're going to be having this afternoon. Thank you very much, Folawe. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, um, she's very right. The results uh, went up over one year from 39% to nearly 80% pass at WAEC, which was excellent and uh, made us very happy and pleased. But you know, we've had to understand that uh, we need to look at the total education in the state holistically. And so what we did was to address the students who were not getting up to SS3. And uh, take, uh, taking day, uh, you know, we researched this and found out that, uh, I hate to, I hesitate to mention the figures, but a significant proportion of our students were coming in in JS1 and not finishing. They were dropping off along the line with the greatest attrition rate coming from GSS3 to SS1 and from SS2 to SS3. Of course, you don't just take figures like that and say, well, what do we do? You have to find out why. So we now picked one of our districts and went after some of the students who had dropped off to find out why or what they were doing. Mostly they were apprenticed to all sorts of craftsmen or they were in the market selling and buying or they had simply just dropped off and uh, were contributing to the area boy syndrome in the state. Now this was very worrying and uh, it was clear that the educational system that we were providing was just not meeting their needs. And, and let's be frank about it, it was not fit for purpose. Because there were many students who were not interested. You see, the way our uh, WAEC and everything, our schools, um, just, you know, the 334, 
or one nine three four system goes is that we are preparing everybody to go to university, to go to tertiary institutions. Now, from many of our schools, they are not going to go to tertiary institutions. First of all, remember that every year, and I hesitate to quote the figures, but let's say about 1.6 million students sit for JAMP. Only about 700,000 are going to receive admission, no matter what your score is. There's nothing, at least a million would not get any admission whatsoever because of the university's carrying capacity. So what do you do to the remaining students? What should they do? They have to make a living as well. And there are other ways to make a living because even when they go to university and finish, many of them still do not find jobs or don't know what to do. So that's when <laughs> we had to come to the conclusion that we had to start thinking about providing a fit for purpose educational system for them. And uh, by focusing on their strengths, acknowledging that um, according to Gardner's multiple intelligences theory and many other theories, all of us have multiple intelligences. Most of us in this class, in this room now, are probably academic in orientation. You know, but there are other people who have other strengths. There are people who are musical in inclination. There are people who want to work with their hands. There are people who are sociable, gregarious, get along with all sorts of people, anybody. There are people who are, sports, who are into sports. So why don't we ensure that our educational system can speak to the multiplicity of intelligences and abilities that exist? And that's when we decided that we would, we, and it's clear from what Dr. Salami said, that if we are going to ensure that majority of the children in this state are able to make a living, we had better start thinking differently about just providing a, an educational system that uh, is sending them to university. Think about other things that they can do. I, I could go on and on, but um, so I think I'm trying to say the focus has shifted now more to, to what's called TVET, that is technical vocational education, because that's where the jobs are. I know Tylers who are earning close to 800,000 Naira a month. There is no teacher that earns that much. And the teacher went through four years of university and so on. There is no engineer who goes into normal, uh, to a normal workplace that earns as much as that at uh, you know, uh, early stage career. Well, that's because there are very few Tylers. Most of our Tylers come from Bene. And so why don't we as a state start thinking about providing the Tylers that will improve the countries, uh, that, that, that will ensure that our children have jobs good enough to give them a great living. I think I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Dave Stiles. And I think I want us to stay a bit more on, you know, just something that you've raised there um, around TVET. And I think it's important that you sort of share with us what is the current state of vocational and technical schools in Lagos State? And what are the challenges that Lagos State is facing, you know, with regards to the, the operationalization of these institutions? Well, in Lagos State, um, we started off, we, we do have um, five major technical colleges spread across Ibile. I'm sure you've been hearing about Ibile. That means uh, Ibile in Lagos State. And they're, they're doing excellent work. In fact, it was a study of their system that uh, showed us that this was the most successful economic model that we had. Because checking out their graduates, three years after graduation, we found they were doing one of three things. They had either gone on to tertiary institutions where they were doing HND or even BSc engineering, or they were in full employment because they were skilled, or they were entrepreneurs running their own businesses. So it's clear that that, that, that was more, much more what can I call? It, it, it made more sense, honestly, than the track to Waiek and beyond, where we found that majority of them were still on the streets doing nothing three years after leaving us for those who finished. And those who didn't even finish had very little hope. So the, the challenges really, and then uh, beyond that, uh, we, we decided that, look, let's try, but, but you know, being in the Ibile, they are far away for some children. They are not close. And the important thing for us now was to bring it close to as many children as possible. So we decided to pilot a scheme where we would run uh, TVET in existing secondary schools. We have 12 pilot schemes. We call them comprehensive schools. I'm hoping that we'll fold them into the general TVET eventually. And, uh, uh, and, and these are, so these are close to where the children live. They can go from home. They don't have to, a child in Surulere, the nearest would be like Agidingvi. 
So why don't you find something in Surulere for such a child? Uh, but the major challenges that we are facing, of course, there's always funding. There are more expensive schools to set up than typical schools. You can get away in a primary school with six rooms, um, blackboard, and so on. But with Tibet, you have to have a workshop, you have to have equipment, you have to have trained teachers, and trained teachers are a rarity indeed. So, funding, teaching staff, because there's hardly any university that is really training teachers on technical skills, hardly. So you, you find that getting teachers, you know, we've had to say, look, let's be unconventional. You said let's be audacious, right? So let's get people who are skilled, say a skilled uh, tiler, and let him teach our children. We'll teach him how to be a teacher. We'll train him, teach him, and, and Falawe knows about that, about taking people who didn't study education at all and who end up becoming phenomenal teachers through the Teach for Nigeria scheme. So if we follow that kind of scheme, why not? So there's the problem of paucity of teaching staff. There's uh, the fact that um, there's a confusion. We, we still have to go through the bureaucracy and understand how we are going to ensure that those schools don't fall into the typical school. In other words, to ensure that they, they, they outlive uh, every government that comes in. And then, of course, there's, of course, that's why we have to build in sustainability, whether it's through the law or through the policies of the state. So I think those are my major problems there. Finance, teaching staff, getting the correct teaching staff and managing the bureaucracy. But as for the enthusiasm of the children, their parents, you know, people used to say nobody wants their child to do uh, vocational subjects because they think it's for children who are, you know, but nowadays they can't see. That is the child. You know, before, if you were playing football, your father would beat you properly. Now you will encourage your child, your mates are playing football and sending dollar home. You better, you are reading. Better go out and play football or basketball. So it's clear that there is a shift. And we now have to take advantage, ride that shift, and ensure that we get our people to do the things that will give them jobs and a good living. Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. David Sayo. And thank you for highlighting the challenges. I saw you nodding Boboye when she talked about the mindset yeah. of parents, you know, who are no longer actually saying that, you know, their children should not go to technical schools. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there are thoughts and, and comments that you want to share. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ma, for the um, uh, deep answers. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak as a rebel boy, right? And then I will speak as an employer. Um, I think um, just beyond beyond the um, the problems, right? That um, um, she has um, mentioned. I think there is also a societal thing that we also need to deal with. Um, there is a societal mindset that we need to deal with. Um, and you know, just uh, you know, piggybacking on some of the things she mentioned around the fact that people drop off, you know, um, school in the, by the time they get to GSS three and then to SS. Um, classes. Um, I, while she was speaking, I just casted my mind back to when I was in secondary school, and I realized that the, the time I struggled was the first time I needed to make a choice. And the first time I needed to make that choice was GSS. I was not sure where I wanted to go. And so there was commercial, there was science class, there was art, and I remember back then, we were told um, the science class or the science students are the smartest ones. And so, um, for me, it, um, I gained my sense of achievement um, um, be, out of being a science student, right? And did I make a good, was that a good decision? I don't know. I, I, was, I had this fair side chat with a prof just uh, earlier. And I was like, you know, five years of electronics, electrical engineering. And here I am, CEO of a recruitment agency. Um, am I able to find the, the linkage between that time I needed to make that decision in GSS3, right, and what I'm doing now. What I think is needed um, for the students is the ability to find that pathway to real life um, um, relevance. Real life relevance. Um, you know, and it's the same thing we're experiencing even in the workplace. So we, we hear things like white collar, blue collar, and you hear things like, you know, I don't want to work in the blue collar space. But hey, that is what pays. That is even what is available, right? You know, she mentioned something around tiling, and the, oh, no, no, I don't want to be a tiler. But they make the most money, you know. Um, you know, for, 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 right now, we, the, 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 
most popular thing, and I'll round off with this, the most popular thing now is Jaguar. Everybody says Jaguar, you know. And I ask myself, so you Jaguar to do what? Okay, Jaguar for school, fine. But then some of the opportunities that people are even fighting to go um, um, latch onto in those countries, they are, they are the opportunities we classify as blue collar. Here, the same opportunities. Right. So for me, I think it's just important for us to have that mindset change as a society, as a people. It's beyond, it's beyond the, the, the suit and the tie. It's beyond that. Right. It is what is available. Where can we make the most impact? How can we fit into the environment or the society? Thank you. Thank you very much. What is available? How can we make the most impact? And how can we fit? I'm going to come to you now, Mrs. Lawson, and you know, a lot has been shared around the number of you know, the projects happening and the initiatives happening in Lagos State around you know, building more comprehensive schools, also ensuring that they're investing in the existing technical schools. But I want to come to you, and I know that you do a lot of work with the private sector and private schools, and you know, data shows, to, shows us that there are nine times more private schools than there are public schools in Lagos State. You know, what are the opportunities that you see here, and what are your thoughts and your perspective on this um, conversation that we're having? Thank you very much for that question. And um, really, as um, Mrs. Um, Adifisayo was speaking, you know, what came to my mind is the issue of partnerships. And a lot of the times, we do talk about private-public partnerships, but how are we implementing it? So if we think about vocational schools, as you were saying, if you check the spend by corporate organizations on training, compared to the education budget, there was a research that actually showed companies were spending more on on-the-job training than you know, formal education, the education budget. So, especially in the area of vocation, I can bet you that most of the construction companies that we have, that are building houses, already have in-house training organizations for their workers. I remember I visited a few private, actually, vocational schools around Lekki as well. So there are opportunities for partnership in those areas that partner with the public sector that already has those facilities that are even looking to train their staff to actually implement. The other thing too is that as we start to build out infrastructure, housing, those are some of the budgets that we have, all those who we give those contracts to should be mandated to set up vocational schools to train Nigerians to actually do it. So that we're not bringing in people from India, China to come and actually do construction or jobs that Nigerians should be able to do. And I would say that the mindset is already changing about vocational studies. In fact, Forbes just last week released an article saying that even in America, the demand for university education has started to decline because people are seeing that there are higher return on investment on education in vocational studies and skills. But there's opportunity for partnership. The thing I would also want to point out in terms of the partnership is that sometimes people feel, oh, education should be free. There are ways to partner with the private sector who is looking for a sustainable way with government then offering scholarships, subsidies, or even grants to make sure that organizations build out those schools or facilities for those kind of training. So those are the kinds of things that I sort of see. Like in the US, we have the charter schools where the government actually pays for those privately run schools to be attended by low-income households and they have access to free education. But more importantly to me in terms of transformation of education is the teachers. Where are we getting teachers from that would then work and train this new form of education? Are we providing them with the knowledge, the competence, and the skills that they need to be able to provide that training? And it's one thing that affects both the private and public sector. Um, UNESCO actually published that we have, say, 17 million, that's sub-Sahara Africa only, 17 million shortage in teachers. So I was speaking at a, a teacher conference um, just last week, and I was asking if there were 17 million vacancies for doctors, I can bet you everybody's going to apply to become a medical doctor. So why are we not applying to become teachers? We have this vacancy. That means there's a guaranteed job. We need to look at how we are training our teachers. Are we providing them with the relevant skills? How are we making the job attractive? I challenged the government then to actually say, 
if you become a teacher, no tax for five years or something. You see, people will start rushing. We just need to be innovative in how we actually train and recruit and inspire people to become teachers. It's critical for anything we want to do in education. Thank, Thank you. you so much for touching on a topic that I'm really passionate about <laughs> yes. and that I completely agree with you. I don't think that Lagos State will rise above the quality of its teachers and I don't think that we're going to achieve the development plan without really looking at how we're upskilling and recruiting and investing in teachers. And that takes me to you, um, Mrs. Pande. Um, what really can we be doing to upskill and to adequately equip the teachers who are going to be training, you know, the students, um, you know, across the schools in Lagos State. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of the panel, and it's a good follow-on from, from where you left it off. Now, there's a myriad of factors uh, related to supply, to demand, and systemic factors that, det that determine the quality of the workforce. And in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on three of them. The first is the size of the teaching workforce. Uh, the quality problem across Nigeria cannot be solved until we solve the adequacy problem. There's a global shortage of teachers. Across the world, we need 69 million more teachers. I can't imagine how many football fields we would, we would fill with 69 million more teachers. And that's no different for Nigeria. At a primary school level alone, we need 168,000 teachers, right? Um, so to be able to solve this problem in the immediate term, we need a very flexible approach. And some of the colleagues here have talked about that. We need to bring back retired teachers into the system. We need to upgrade the skill of unqualified teachers. We need to implement a system of recognizing prior learning. And we need to go to those underserved communities and directly select those teachers because they are prepared to work in those communities. But we also need to think about the pipeline. Where are the new teachers going to come from? Well, we've got to start off by making this an attractive profession, something that is valued by society heavily. This is done in many other countries. Finland is successful because teaching is an attractive profession. There's two things you do. Number one, remuneration. But you, remuneration is not everything. Working conditions matter. How you value people matters. Now, in Lagos State, this might not be a problem, but certainly in other states, teachers are not being paid their salary on time, right? The infrastructure, every day when you put on your suit and you go off to school with your bag, there's no toilet. There's no running water. That's what a professional is facing. How would you carry on doing that job, right? Then more than that, you don't have the tools to perform your profession. 30% of teachers in Nigeria don't have access to the curriculum. What will you teach when you walk into the classroom? So if you want to solve new entrants coming into, this, uh, into the education system, you need to solve these things. These are not complex challenges. It can be solved. One last thing I want to say in the presence of the Honorable Minister about new entrants is that we need to be bold and innovative, right? The Education Commission announced in 2018 that the education system should begin to think about task shifting, diversifying the teaching workforce. I'll admit to you, I'm a pharmacist by profession. When I was running a pharmacy, I had three professionals in a pharmacy. One, the pharmacist, myself. I had a pharmacist assist assistant behind the counter helping me dispense. And then I had a pharmacy assistant in the front running the front shop. That's three professionals running a single pharmacy. Why is it that we have one person, especially in Nigeria, running a classroom with a hundred learners in it? How on earth will learning take place when you have one teacher to a hundred children? We need innovation. The basis of this is data. You need credible data. To run a school, you have an education management information system. For teachers, we need a teacher information management system that helps you recruit, that helps you deploy, and that helps you manage. UNICEF has developed such a system. We've tested it in eight states, and it's ready to be taken to scale. I'm going to come to the quality of education. Now, I must tell you, and this is my take-home message, and I'll repeat it later on. We need to kill cascade training. It has not worked anywhere in the world. 
There's no empirical evidence to support it. In fact, what we show when we drip down training, by the time the last person receives it, there's hardly anything left to it. So we've lost all of this training. What we need is a teacher-centered training system, one that puts the teacher at the center and is school-based and classroom-based. So it's a teacher coming together with a peer to say, what is the real world problem we're trying to solve? Is it that children can't read? So how can we do this better together? It needs mentorship, it needs coaching, and it needs strong instructional leadership. The principal is not just there to count how many people attended to school. He is first and foremost an instructional leader. He is directing teaching and learning, and we need to use that better. We're in a post-COVID world. We can never go back only to in-person learning. We are in the era of blended learning. And in Nigeria, we've got too many children sitting outside of the schooling system. So we will never be able to teach them all in a formal school. We need in-person training and we need remote learning. Together, these two things go together. And the teacher needs to be able to deliver that. Now, I must say that yet, I'm talking about technology. Learning happens at the instructional core. It is a human experience when the teacher, the student, and the text come together. And tomorrow, if I give a, me a mediocre teacher a tablet, that doesn't make him a great teacher. He remains a mediocre teacher. Technology is a tool that will enable a teacher to be able to deliver a fantastic lesson. And we can do it with very low tech. It allows a teacher to access open resource content. It allows him to virtually receive coaching, to see a model lesson in action. And it allows for differentiated instruction in the classroom. Miss, Miss, I know you're going to stop me. Stop no, One no, last yes. thing and then no, I'll stop. I'll bring you on. Well, One I'm last really, thing. Okay. Oh One last thing and I'll, I will close okay. it. I'm passionate about yeah, this. You I can, can see tell. it. Yes. So we have the tool. We have a Nigeria learning passport. It is a digital platform. It's got 15,000 materials on it. And in this room, I know we have a number of private sector partners. We need your partnership on data, on connectivity and devices, and we need your partnership on the offline version. I'm going to stop there because I know I've taken oh, up no, my thank time. Thank you yes. so very much. Well yes. Um, and as, as you were sharing, like, what came to my mind really is I mean, why is this not happening? Like, what is really the challenge? And Mr. Dave, sorry, I want to come to you before, you know, we continue. She shared a lot of, um, you know, ideas, a lot of, you, you know, recommendation and just things that could be happening very differently. She stopped to partnership, um, potential partnerships here, you know, and individuals here who could support with data and other areas and aspects. But with you sitting in government and with where you sit and the lens that you wear, what is the challenge with implementing and executing and delivering on just some of the things that have been shared? Thank you very much. I, um, I'll take it that she was talking about Nigeria and not Lagos State. That's, <laughs> that's the first thing. And um, I think I'm not one of those people who come here and say we are doing it, we are doing it. But I think in fairness to us, we should have talked about Lagos State. We should have. Because the Nigerian Learning um, Passport, we are part of it. We launched it. We are used, we, I mean, we have teachers who have tablets and so on. So we are part of it. And when it uh, comes to partnerships, and so I, I'm not going to respond anymore other than to say that, you see, many things happen, but um, um, we need, there's so much to be done. It's quite daunting. Let, let me start from there. So when, you, when, we talk, when we talk, first of all, about teachers, we have teachers who come, like, uh, we don't have a problem or supply of teachers. What we have is recruitment. If we open a recruitment portal, within 10 days, we have 100,000 people on that portal. We have to shut it down because maybe we are only going to take 2,000. Since, we, since uh, uh, the governor gave us permission, I think we've recruited like seven to 8,000 teachers. It's still not enough, but it's still within the, you know, there's also the funding issue. We have to pay salaries. And uh, in Lagos, Lagos State pays the highest salaries in Nigeria. 
across all levels. You are a level eight teacher, you earn what a level eight engineer, lawyer, or whatever is earning. You even earn a little bit more because there's a special allowance if you are teaching in certain parts of the, the state. So we have to be mindful of the budget. I think Sam is here. You don't want us to crash the budget. So um, there, there's uh, so much that is happening. And my own frustration, let me put it that way, is that I wish we could do more, but there are constraints as well. And I don't want the constraints to pull us down. That's why we are working with a lot of partners. For instance, I mentioned the comprehensive schools. I'm sure we have up to 50 partners. Some who, are, who supplied the curriculum to us, because we didn't want to use the curriculum of IEC. It's very theoretical. We wanted to use a practical curriculum whereby when we train a tiler, he goes out and he can tile floors, and not that he can draw what a floor would look like after being tiled. So we had to... Um, we, we, some gave us their curriculum, some helped us with assessment methods, some uh, building workshops for us, some trained our teachers, and some even funded things like, because I had to keep talking to the private sector, come and join us, come and support us. I had to have various breakfast meetings. Some funded our breakfast meetings. Some have funded textbooks for us. Some are writing textbooks for us. So it's a huge thing. And uh, the state keeps on working. It's just that we are constrained. And like she said, we do need partners. We do need a lot of partners. When it comes to the Nigerian learning platform, for instance, that she's talking about, that, that was great for us and we took part in it. But before then, we had our own platform. You remember COVID? We were able to continue teaching during COVID because we first deployed the lowest form of technology was radio. Then we moved to TV. Then we moved to the use of systems. Um, what you call devices, and found that many of our students cannot afford devices. So we had to work with uh, various partners. Partners donated devices. Uh, I think two or three of the tel telcos gave us data for three years. So those devices op would operate for three years without buying any data whatsoever. So there are many companies that are working with us, but we need a lot more, it's clear. Because the sheer volume, if I tell you that there was a school that two, three years ago, had, no, don't let me exaggerate, maybe five years ago, had maybe 3,000 students. Today they have 10,000. Now, you say the classes are large. Who do you turn away? Please tell me who we should turn away. And don't forget that Lagos doesn't have land. We, we try building up, but we've, we, we don't have land anymore. And therefore, the most creative way by which we are going to have to grow is through the, use of, is through the deployment of technology. And that's something that we are working on. That's why we were very happy with their own, uh, when they came up with this idea. Because we had started it before they came. I mean, we latched onto it. But we do have an existing, um, yeah, we do have our existing portal with our own schemes of work, our own uh, assessments online as well. So it was good. Now the students have access to two to three platforms. But again, can you see that there's something about it in that people are doing little bits and pieces and we are not uh, having a, you know, a coherent whole in everything that we are doing. So I, I, like I said, I'm not here to say we are doing it or we are not doing it. It's a long journey. It's a very tough journey. But we do need a lot of partners. And I assure you, a lot of people are working with us. You are working with us. I, thank you so much for sharing. No, and I think, you know, just what you've shared, Ms. Adif Sayo, reflects something that I, you know, I always talk about, which is the, the challenges within the education system is so complex. Like administering, running, um, and operating an any educational system requires diverse like you sat here you talked about the commissioner for budget and planning you know you've highlighted like different players and different stakeholders and if all of those different pieces and individuals are not working together education would not lead to the dream that we all desire and i think that really is going to take me to boboye um really no, 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 I'll get to Prof. No, 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 I'll get to Prof. But I you want to come finish to... finish first. Yes, I want to come to Boboye. And that's because, you know, it, you know, a lot has been said around partnerships. Mm. And I think, you know, yes, Mr. Adifsa, you mentioned what some of the telco were doing with giving data and what have you. But we're thinking about the long game. You know, this is not something that is just, you know, over the next five years. We're planning for the next 30 years. Mm. And Boboye, like, what, how can, part, like, private sector or diverse stakeholders work sustainably with Lagos State Government to ensure that we're able to achieve all this recommendation and this desire that we all have. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think the first step we, we, is this conversation. 
right this is the first, this is a, so this is a step in the right direction and i, I think it's uh, it's important to give um, kudos to, to the to the government for for this um and i think so a second way is actually to leverage on the on the private on you know the training faculty of the private sector um my my, my colleague here mentioned something a few minutes ago that companies if you do a, a an aggregate of the budget for Train company training compared to our educational budget, they actually have a lot more, right? Um, so it's important that to know that the, the 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 private sector and the world of work that is expecting these people also understand, and they already have a structure that works, right? And it is very very important that even the the educational system adopts, you know, what works on their own side. Um, a typical employer right now. Um, is more concerned about how teachable um, an individual is beyond just graduating with a certain degree because they understand the problem. They know that it's a, it will take a long um, time to solve it. You will need to pull a lot of resources together to solve it. So they solve their own problem, which is, you know what, can I identify that you're teachable? What are the metrics to identifying that you're teachable? Then they plug you into their own teaching uh, system right get you up to speed and then they launch you into their world of work so i think one way to do you know to to leverage partnership right is to ask ourselves what exactly do we want to change and what do we want to get out of these people so it's one thing to say you know what i want the telcos to bring to give me data i want this to do you know to give me um, um buildings but it's important to also come from what is the need for them so it's important that when we're asking for these things they need to find themselves in it as a businessman I would think if you want me to invest into education, which of course I need, I have invested, I have solved my own problem, but you want us to solve this problem together, right? What is in it for me? So um, uh, my appeal to government um, is that, you know, government should be the, the one, um, you know, bringing all of this together. There are a lot of things happening in silos. Um, I, you know, my, uh, my colleague here, she was very pa passionate about, you know, the many things that, um, you know, um, UNICEF is doing, uh, you know, at, at the global stage. Um, I think it's also very important that we acknowledge the different things happening across board, and we now need to have one person or one body or one system. And I think the government is actually more positioned to be able to do that, to bring all of these parties together, right? And say, you know what, what is the need for you? What is the need for you? Right? Have that conversation, a roundtable conversation like this one, right? To then start to take learnings from the things that we have done that worked. So, um, um, you know, that's just the, the, the big the big framework here. Yeah. No, thank you so much. But I still I still no no I still want your thoughts on one more thing. Awesome. Because okay. you said mentioned like the funding challenge. There yeah. was the teacher quality challenge. Yeah. There's the bureaucracy challenge, and you've mentioned you know the need to sort of like harmonize all the different companies stakeholders. and stakeholders, you know, mm -hmm. to come together mm -hmm. to find what is unique for them and to also share what the state is trying to achieve. Yeah. Now, in terms of the funding, because I, I think that really is also critical to achieving and attaining a lot of things. Like, what is it? How can private sector come in to support, you know, the plan for vocational training um, in so I think it's, I think government can think think about it this way uh, for the companies um, a form of um, investment, right? And when you think about investment, you think about ROI. What is the pathway to the ROI on this my investment? So, for example, um, some form of tax breaks, for instance, could con could encourage you know these companies to to to, to contribute funds. Um, there is the ITF, right? Um, and for for most of these companies, uh, they grudgingly pay ITF. Oh, it's federal, right? Maybe it's maybe we can actually have something, you know, for the states because, as much as possible, I for once, of course, I can speak for my company. We pay ITF, but then we ask ourselves every time we're paying, and I see it in the books. Why am I paying ITF again? Right? We know that we so we, we in, in theory we know why we are doing this, but then we just it's just important to find that pathway. That pathway is not visible. So for a for a business for the private sector to happily invest into the education sector, they need to find the ROI. That pathway needs to be there. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much.
And, and I think this also ties to something that came up. I don't remember the name of the lady, but she was on the panel with the um, with his with his excellency, mm -hmm. where she shared you know something around the communication bit. Mm -hmm. And I think this also ties to it, right? If government puts something like that, you know, forward, how do you ensure that you communicate clearly, you know, to the public on how this is, whether transforming, what exactly it's doing, and people will be motivated and encouraged to, to invest in it. So an ITF for Lagos State is in the pipeline. <laughs> now to you, um, Prof, um, and, you know, I've really been just trying to, you know, gather all the ideas and thoughts that have been coming together. But given where you sit, and given the fact that you know the world of work is changing, what are your what is your perspective? What 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 is your you know in terms of like what should be happening differently and what Lagos State should be doing towards attaining you know this brand new um, education for its populace? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I could say that people are talking about well education, secondary school, primary school, but I'm sure. You have probably brought me here to talk about education at the university level, tertiary education. Because even when you talk about the quality of teachers, I mean, Lagos State government has just uh, transmuted uh, Mockbed. That is uh, my, uh, Michael Tedola, you know, primary I mean, college of education, and I didn't know it was college of education, to a university of education. And it's for a purpose. And part of, the, I mean, part of the reason for that is in terms of the quality of teachers, especially teachers. I mean, it reminds me, because I was actively involved with the implementation of 6334. And it, is the tech, it was the technical component of the 6334 that was not properly implemented. And it was not properly implemented because of shortage of teachers to handle the technical assets. So it occurred to me when you are saying, and we do hope that the new University of Education will be, I mean, really engaged in producing teachers that can handle the technical, you know, aspect. You hope? It's going to be, yes, that's the way we have designed it, because I've been involved. I'm involved with it, and it is that they have to, you know, look. But generally speaking, I mean, there all these areas you are talking about, whether it's in health or power or something, education has an important role to play. And... So we should be looking at the entire gamut of education from the lower to the tertiary education. And my own concern, you know, what I want to share is that, look, we have been talking about, I mean, somebody said that university is no longer now, I mean, popular or something like that. I mean, of course, graduate employability. I mean, we're all aware of it, that our graduates coming out are not having the right skills. And some of us had the opportunity of being involved you know, at the level of policy at the National Universities Commission, where we just had to really address the question, how could we make up graduates, you know, I mean, to be employable? Because they were not having the skills. Now, I mean, the, the, the skills. And one thing that we have come out with, which you have mentioned, is collaboration. University teachers can no longer do it alone. It is now what you call triple helix. Government, industry, university collaboration. You know, because teachers alone cannot handle, you know, the type of training now expected in the university. You have to bring private, I mean, people in the, I mean, parents have to also participate. Now, of course, there's need now for a kind of, a, I mean, a change, I mean, for, I mean, for such people to, I mean, to come in. But, in that, but if I'm share you, with you what we have got when we studied nations that have solved graduate employability, having the right skills, five things that they have done which also we must, you know, do. One, you must institutionalize the determination of the skills that you require on all fronts, not only teachers, in industry. The skill set required, most countries, you take, for example, Ireland, and also they have a ministry for skills determination. What are the skills that you require? Whether it's for teachers, whether it's for operators in manufacturing and so on, you have this. It's very, very important. Then the second thing, okay, let's say in the university, is the curriculum. Now, at the level of uh, NUC now, we have changed the curriculum from what we used to have. Because what we used to have is like return to sender, that type of thing. Then now the curriculum now that is going all over the world is what they call outcome-based curriculum. In other words, it must be skills embedded. That, you see, but what sort of skills? It will have been skills you yourself, you have identified. 
that your graduates must have now embedded. That is what we have now. But that curriculum, like I said, is not something that only lecturers will deliver. No, private sector must also come in in delivering, you know, I mean, the lecture. Then another thing, the third one, very, very important, is that when the students are within the four walls, there must be some platform of exposure, you know, to the end user, to the industry. We use that at the University of Ibadan when we started the Faculty of Technology. We call it what they call SIWES now, Student Industrial Work Experience. When we had it, when, while other graduates were in other universities, were spending only three years to get their degree in Ibadan, they were spending four years. We had an equivalent of one year of industrial attachment, and it made a lot of difference. So the same thing is being done now, but you know, we, in other words, we have to take it seriously. It's no longer being handled seriously. Whereas students get when they are still within the four walls of the, whether the school, whether you polytechnic or school or university, when they have exposure, you know, out there. So that is uh, another thing. Then institutions must also be made to carry out what you call trace studies. Where are your products out there? Are they doing well? What are the shortcomings? Those are the sort of things that you bring back, you know, to improve on curriculum. You know, thank you so much. I want to stop you. Okay. And I, 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 what I, you know, as you were sharing, you talked about the two new universities in, a, in Lagos in State, Lagos. you know, that, that is looking at education specifically. No, one is looking at education. The okay. other one is more or less is science and tech. Science and Lagos technology, Lagos State University. Yes. So the one looking at education, there were a lot of, you know, great ideas that um, Mrs. Pandey shared. And I'm just wondering, how much of what she shared is so currently embedded in this university that you know has just been you know named and set up? If you could just share a bit around that, I think that could. Well, a, a lot. I mean, I'm not really. I mean, I'm more an engineer. I was more involved in the Lagos State University of Science and Tech in terms okay. of uh, I mean those skills and. We are, I mean, I'm looking forward to a situation whereby they will make a lot of difference. But also the Lagos State University of Education too. They were, I mean, we were collaborating in terms of yeah, what we have always told them. You must go out there and see what is required, you know, out there in the whether in the schools or private or something like that, and then you can then bring back. So it's not just a question that uh, I mean, you, you, I mean, your students get, leave your system. No, I mean, we have gone beyond that now. Each institution must do what we, what we now call trace studies. Trace studies. Where are your products and how well are they doing? And how will the outcome of that inform, you know, I mean, your curriculum and, I mean, the delivery? Thank you. I see, I see an opportunity here. Um, because, you know, a university already exists that is looking to upskill and train, you know, teachers, teachers, you know, to the quality that we have. And I'm, you know, the hope is that we get it right at this point so that we can build that critical pipeline of quality teachers for Lagos State. Ms. Pandey, do you want to say something? Okay. okay. Well, no, no, but yeah. that, well, why saying that? Yes. We also, in the university, I'm a lecturer. Yes. We also have our own skill gap. Because it's one thing to have curriculum, excellent, taking care of all these things we are talking about. How do you deliver the curriculum? I mean, the lecturers, I mean, for example, when we were wondering about this, in the university, I happen to be former vice chancellor of the University of Ibadan, and when we were talking about this need for reorientation to make sure that we are no longer lecturers, we are now facilitators. There are some students out there that know more than you. There's no leg explosion. Let us get, get it right. And it's, I tell my student, if you rely on what I'm teaching you, you have failed. You have failed. And I've seen that in practical way. A student, I gave a project. I gave the first student, he did that project third year. Okay, he did well, and not quite there. Second year, I gave it to another student. He did. The third year, I gave it to another student. And I explained to him what he should have. I mean, this was a high simulation you know, uh, project. It was supposed to work on it for a whole session. After three weeks in the first semester, it came to be that he had solved the problem. Uh, I said, oh, you mean you don't understand the problem? <laughs> no, he said, sir, I understand. I like the project. Okay. I said, bring it. I was in my, on my seat. As he was coming through the door, the computer was holding like this. 
I said, yes. Allah did. <laughs> because that computer happened to be superior to mine. And by the time he came, he said, okay, you said yes. Okay, show me. By the time he was showing me, honestly, it was beyond what I gave him. He solved what I gave him and went beyond. So I now said, how about the platform I taught to in class? Ah, that platform. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> that one is old. And what happened? He did an industrial attachment in a company dealing with software. So he was exposed to the latest you know, software. So I only had to beg him, please, can you help me install that platform on my computer? <laughs> and he looked at my computer and said, I will try. He, he installed it for me. Then I took it. I said, I'll be going to the class to introduce this. He said, but when I'm there, you better keep your mouth shut. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. That's knowledge I'm, explosion for yeah, you. Yeah. That's knowledge explosion. We've, we've been having this conversation over the last 40 minutes, and I'd like to welcome, I saw heads nodding, you know, and heads shaking in the audience, and, you know, everyone who might be joining online as well. So are there questions? Any burning questions that you have? Okay. Interesting. And um, please introduce yourself and then indicate who you'd like to answer the question. We'll start with you. You can use your teacher voice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Excuse me. Now. My name is Arthur. I'm the head of vision for Youth in Diaspora. I help governments and organizations unite young people for nation building and national development. Um, I've heard what everyone has said so far. I, I put some things in my parking lot just to highlight. I love the fact that the Honorable Commissioner mentioned you know, TVET. You know, working on the Medium to National Development Plan for this country is good to see at the state level that people are actually taking some of the recommendations that we suggested. Because one of the things we also said is we can recommend and then suggest a lot of things, but the challenge is the implementation. So hearing that from a commissioner um, is something that I was happy to hear. And the second part is um, I'm also uh, part of the Canadian Commission on the Youth Advisory of the United Nations. So uh, I have some, some things that I, I took down as well, and maybe you can give some remarks. Um, in terms of the making the choice in GS3, I worked with uh, organization Youth Employment Services, and you mentioned having a foundational program, program between GS1 um, and SS3, maybe like a pathway to prosperity. Having that conversation to say, what can these young people do from GS1 before they get to GS3, where they would have to decide where they want to go. So having that conversation early, um, and then in terms of transformation of education, with what Ms. Lawson said, uh, with my little research that I've done, the foundation of, of education in this country is not the building, it's not the infrastructure, it's not how the school looks, it's the teachers, the work, the work that we're always doing. So the teachers, I think, are the, are the main issue. Um, and coming to you with UNICEF, you mentioned the size of the workforce. Um, and as we, as we learned, the Nigerian problem or the Niger Nigerian educational system, yes, it's not the same as the Lagos education system. So they have the capacity for the teachers, but this is the challenge that we all come to, is the funding. So we have teachers who are ready to teach, but the challenge is where is the funding coming from? It's it's something that I think we all look at education like it's all in the gas and money flying around it's not. But there are people qualified who are ready to teach. So my question is if we have Thank you. And there is a barcode, while I, while I have you answer the question, I just wanted to let you know there is a barcode in your brochure, I think. So you're to scan that barcode and, you know, type your question in. You know, so we wouldn't be doing, like, if you type your question in that way, they will collate it and share with me. So check for the barcode and, and just type out the question. <coughs> but Mrs. Pandey, do you want to? So let me start off by saying that I did talk a lot about Nigeria. Um, largely, actually. I talked about Nigeria. And the reason I did that is that 
UNICEF is a United Nations Children's Fund. We are here for all children. And in fact, we are here for the poorest children. And so Nigeria will be as strong as its weakest link. So people are not restricted from moving around in the states of Nigeria. You can move anywhere that you want to. We have to act in the interest of the country as a whole. And one of the biggest challenges that the country is facing is that it spends 1.97% of GDP on education. Globally, you are meant to be spending 4 to 6% of GDP on education. Government expenditure should be between 16 to 20% of GDP. Nigeria is at 7%. The pie is too small. No matter how you cut it, the pie is too small. There's just not enough money in the education system in totality to be able to fund those teachers. We spend in this country 80 to 90% of the budget on teachers, and yet it's not enough because the pie is not big enough. So all of you in this room need to begin to advocate in Nigeria to dramatically increase the spending on education. It's the foremost factor that is driving what we're experiencing in, ed in education in the Thank you very much. Do you want to react to that as yes. well? Yes. And maybe, because we just have five minutes to okay, go, yeah. maybe we'll use this last five minutes to just share recommendations. Okay. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to follow up on the spend on education. And I totally agree that we need to increase spend. But also, where are we spending that money? I'd actually done research on, in terms of where we are spending money. And we see a lot of administration you know, the, infrastructure, the uh, ministries and parastatals that so it's not really it's not getting really to get the, schools. the schools. One of the challenges that previously actually asked those in um, education, what is the cost per child that um, Nigerian government spends, both even at state level and at federal? So that's one. And you will see largely, especially at federal, I feel that there needs to be a balancing of where we are spending. How, what percentage of Nigerians go to university? And yet, that is where the large portion of federal budget goes to. I know, <laughs> I don't want to be too controversial there. But if the primary and secondary school education is not done properly, our teachers are not done, um, trained properly to teach at primary and secondary school, what is going to happen at university? That's what we are finding is happening now. So. You know, we need a focus as a nation to say what really, and this was from my cousin, Felicia Phillips, talking about what's the value proposition of the nation, so that we then direct what we are spending to that value proposition. Where do we want education? So we need to be bold and innovative. And so lastly, as my own parting word, is about implementation. When we are thinking about implementation, you need to recruit the right people to actually implement. People who are bold and can actually take that action and the right decision to actually act. And I would say Lagos State has done fairly well because of who Mrs. Madifisa is. You know, that's what I also feel, even in other states, I know we are talking about Lagos State, but as she said, People are fungible. The people move around. You know, Lagos State, I mean, I'm sure most of the people I recruit, it's not only Lagos State schools they went to, that people come in. So we need to make sure that we are appointing the right people that can take the bold decisions that are required. First, for teacher training, who are the right teachers and what should we be teaching them, have a clear direction. And then in terms of spend, all, most, um, there's education tax, even apart from ITF. You wonder where that money goes to. So when you keep saying that where, yes, but what the public investors are complaining to that they are not getting the money. So where is the money going? So other than saying we should increase spend, we need to say where is it being spent? How is it being used? So those are Thank very Thank you key. very much. Mrs. Sunday, closing thoughts, recommendation. There's no magic bullet to solve the education problem. As the Honorable Commissioner said, this is a highly complex endeavor.
right? So it needs a coming together of everybody to put their heads behind the issue, right? Um, whether it is government, it is the private sector, it's civil society, it's young people themselves. You've got many, many young people with bright ideas. It's teachers, all of us coming together, bound by a very common purpose. What is that common purpose? It is to deliver on the right to quality education for each and every child so that they can live a happy life, a prosperous life, and a productive life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, all I want to say is that when we say education, we mean education at all levels. Whether from, even it starts from crash, not even a primary crash, you know, primary, secondary, you know, technical, I mean, schools you are mentioning, then tertiary education, whether polytechnic, university. We have to look at this in all its entirety. Because if you are looking at, I mean, all this projection about skills, skills, skills being required, whether in the industrial space or this, the question is, this, I mean, are the different uh, educational that we deliver, whether for economic development, university, or so, so we should look at it in all its entirety. I know you concentrated on this. Oh boy, eh? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 uh, just one more. Uh, no, no, we have. No, we, we. When we did the exam for students, we didn't stop at it. <laughs> Yeah, because they are more, 